look at this information that came forth. If you'll keep your finger here in Luke 2 and go back to chapter 1, regarding John the Baptist, in verse 67 of Luke chapter 1, and his father, John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost. The same as we read about Simeon was filled with the Holy Ghost. Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he prophesied, saying, verse 68, Blessed be the God, Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Look at the comfort, the edification, the exhortation in this prophecy. Verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, referring to John the Baptist, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord, to prepare his ways. Class, now let me ask you something. If John the Baptist is going to go before the face of the Lord, if he is going to be what is commonly referred to as the forerunner for Christ, this prophecy says that he's going to be, right? Then, can he get the whooping cough and die in infancy? Can he get run over with an automobile or a tractor? No. Why? Because the prophecy was that this child would be the forerunner of Christ. Then how in the world can he be the forerunner of Christ and die before it happens? That'd be nuts, wouldn't it? You see the comfort that's in prophecy? Hardly anybody knows anything about prophecy, so we don't know soup from apple butter. We don't know which way to turn. But when you read the word and you understand these men were filled with the Holy Spirit and it said they prophesied, then from that scripture you understand what prophecy really does. Look at the comfort in that scripture. You just need more of the power of God and you don't have to lay awake all night. Husbands the same way, we fathers. That's right. So the prophecy was he's going to be the prophet of the highest, to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry. Well, bless God. That's why she could go to sleep at night. She had the comfort, the quiet acquiescence, the peace. Don't you see, class, why the church needs this message again of the greatness of God's Word? The church needs to hear the Word of God again so that people who are born again, who are in the church, can again have comfort and peace in their life and not have to run to every psychologist and psychiatrist and all this stuff. I didn't write the word. If you don't like it, complain to management. I have nothing to do with it. But there it is, as plain as the nose on my face. Plainer. Right. Most, <laughs> I cannot emphasize sufficiently. Only God can teach you the greatness of this. I can show you the scripture. But boy, just sit and think for a moment. When he said, Thou shalt be called the prophet of the highest, thou go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. She absolutely had no fear because there was nothing that could kill him. 
There was nothing that could obstruct him. There was nothing that could waylay him because the word of the Lord was, he's got to do this job. People sometimes used to, and sometimes I suppose they still do, think I'm half nuts or something. When I tell them in my classes on power for abundant living, that if you've got a work to do, and you know God's will and God's word, then there is absolutely nothing that can kill you before you get it done. Now, this is not fatalism. This is operating by revelation, by walking. I remember the time I was on the plane going to Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We got into one of these turbulent storms. It was a dilly. You know, when you step in some of these big planes, you, you think, boy, aren't they terrific. They're just bigger and blazing. But somehow or other, when they sometimes get up there and the wind starts to blow, they're real tiny, somehow or other. And that thing just whipped around from one side to the other. We'd drop and we'd go up, we'd drop and boo. And everybody was, almost everybody, was sick on the plane, almost ran out of those paper bags. And it was becoming so turbulent that even the stewardess was almost white, you know, from fear. Because I believe she had almost come to the conclusion that we were going to really bust up. We'd never make it. So she came by holding on, trying to help people that were sick. She was a tremendous lady. Most stewardess are wonderful people. And... I said to her, I said, lady, don't get excited. We're going to Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And she looked at me, you know, with eyes like hen's eggs, wondered what kind of touched fellow this was, see. And then I said to her a little further, I said, look, I said, God wants me in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I'm on this plane, and I'm going to Calgary, Alberta, and you're going along whether you like it or whether you don't, because I'm going. And then she thought I was nuttier or nuts, see? That's right. You know what she didn't understand? That before I had ever left Van Wert, Ohio, I had the go sign, and God wanted me in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. All the arrangements were made the way I was to go, now, how in the world could I get to Calgary, Alberta, Canada and get dead on the way because a plane cracked up? It's impossible, right? As long as we're in the will of the Lord. And as we got into Calgary, she was quite a different lady. She was just beaming. She was just effervescing. And she said to me, well, who was I? And I told her I was a preacher. And then she was still more shocked. And uh, a number of other things that came up been a long time ago since I had this experience, but I think of these things and other things that you can document in your own life. How many times have you been close to being accidentally killed, for instance? Well, why weren't you? There must be a reason, and I'm sure of this thing, that as a believer, and walking on the word, you've got a ministry to accomplish. You've got a job to do. Well, bless God, if I were you, I'd find out. If I didn't know, I'd find out what that job was, and I'd get it done. <laughs> At least start on it. Don't hurry it, but start on it. <laughs> right? Sure. Get to moving on the thing. Because, people, when we are in the center of God's will, as this child was, as Simeon was, you can read story after story like this in the Bible, nothing could ever terminate their life, their existence, until that which they had to do was accomplished. And what a comfort prophecy is, and how little people know about prophecy. How little. M about all they know about prophecy is that somebody says, well, prophecy must be foretelling. Like Isaiah foretold, Jeremiah foretold, F-O-R-E. That's part of it.
But the greatest part of prophecy is that manifestation in operation where there is simply F-O-R-T-H, a foretelling of the will of God for God's people at that particular time. Just like you heard here tonight. When two or three of our people, whoever were, brought a word in prophecy, that word was just for you who are here tonight. And if you heard it, and if you understood it, and walk on it, it will come to pass exactly as you heard it, with not one bit omitted in any way, shape, or form. He said, Thou child shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins through the tender mercy of our God. Look at the comfort in that. Whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. Had at the time, historically speaking, of this prophecy of Zacharias in verse 78, had Jesus Christ been born? No. And yet in prophecy as it came forth, he's put in the past tense that which was still future. You know why it can be put in the past tense? Because it's future? Because God has established it. As he said to Simeon, you will not die until after you have seen the Lord's Christ. It was established, set. Therefore, he could put it in the past tense. He said, this day spring from on high hath visited us. Christ had not yet been born. Did he lie? No, no, no. Because what God's word says, God means, and it will come to pass. Therefore, you can put it in the past tense, even though it's in the future. That's why the scripture says we've already been translated, seated in the heavenlies with him. It's in the past tense, although it's still future. 